All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another exciting day in the world of chemistry. Our objective for the day today is to develop a model of covalent bonding, and in doing so, be able to represent bonding within a molecule by drawing a Lewis dot structure. Uh, please make sure you take out for me before we begin the discussion today your periodic tables and your notes. And we're going to go ahead and get started. All right, ladies and gentlemen, before we move on to developing a model of covalent bonding, we're going to start by reviewing the formation of an ionic bond. If you recall, ionic bonds form between metals and nonmetals. So if, for example, we take an atom of sodium, sodium being on the far left-hand side of the periodic table, has a relatively large radius, and therefore a single loosely bound valence electron. And if we put that sodium in proximity to a fluorine atom, fluorine being in the upper right-hand corner of the periodic table, is a small atom with a relatively high electronegativity, and a set of seven valence electrons. Now you'll notice, if we take sodium's one single loosely held valence electron and move it onto the valence shell of fluorine, in doing so, we move that electron much closer to the nucleus of the fluorine atom and then therefore put it at a much lower level of potential energy. And by moving that electron from sodium onto fluorine, we end up forming a pair of ions. Sodium, having lost one valence electron, gains a positive one charge, therefore forms a cation. And fluorine, picking up its extra valence electron, has now filled its octet and forms a fluoride ion with a minus one charge, an anion. And at this point, we have Paul Abdul rule, which tells us the oppositely charged ions attract one another. And the attractive force brings those ions together to form the familiar compound here, which is, in this case, sodium fluoride. Now, summarizing here, in forming this ionic bond, we combine together a metal that is, again, with a large radius and therefore a low ionization energy, with a nonmetal, a small radius, and therefore a very high electronegativity. And this particular pairing of elements leads to the transfer of electrons from the metal to the nonmetal and the formation of an ionic bond. Now, what if we were going to attempt this exact same scenario, but this time to try and form a bond between two fluorine atoms? Each of those fluorine atoms, again, has a set of seven valence electrons in the valence shell. And if we were to try and take one of those seven valence electrons and move it from one of the fluorines onto the other, in doing so, we would create a positively charged fluoride ion and a negatively charged fluoride ion. However, in the process of doing so, we don't actually move that electron any closer to the nucleus. And therefore, it does not exist at a lower potential energy level. And from a thermodynamics perspective, this is not a favorable transition to occur. So for that reason, we don't expect our model for forming ionic bonds to work between two adjacent fluorine atoms. So instead of forming an ionic bond, recognizing that each fluorine atom has a tendency to gain electrons as highly electronegative atoms, we're going to have to do exactly what you learned how to do in kindergarten when there weren't enough electrons to go around. So given that we need more electrons for each of the two atoms, we're going to have to learn how to share. And at this point, we're going to go ahead and draw what we refer to as Lewis dot structures, showing the electron configurations of these two fluorine atoms. To draw our Lewis dot structures, we're going to start by diagramming a number of valence electrons around each of the fluorine atoms equivalent to the seven electrons fluorine has in its valence shell. So we have two fluorine atoms, each of which have seven valence electrons. And you'll notice here how if we bring those two fluorine atoms closer together, we can share a pair of electrons between the two fluorines, and in sharing that pair, that gives each of the fluorine atoms a grand total of eight electrons around the valence shell, completing their octets. Now, more importantly than that, that puts that shared pair of valence electrons directly in between the nuclei of the two fluorine atoms, therefore at their lowest potential energy level position. That shared pair of electrons between fluorine atoms represents, in this instance, what we refer to as a covalent bond. And recall, each pair of electrons is what we are using to form the bond in this instance. 
Now let's go ahead and have a look at the formation of another covalent bond, but this time we're going to form the covalent bond between two oxygen atoms. Now note here folks, looking at oxygen's position on the periodic table, oxygen in the valence shell has a total of six valence electrons, and if we have two of those oxygen atoms we can represent their Lewis dot structures with two oxygen atoms, each of which has six electrons around the outer valence shell. Now if we follow the same model as last time, by bringing those two oxygen atoms closer together, that puts a shared pair of electrons directly between the oxygen atoms there, but at the same time, the oxygen atoms have still not yet completed their octets. We still have now, if you count up the valence electrons, a total of seven electrons around the outside of each oxygen atom. Now in order to complete the octet again, it appears that there aren't enough electrons to go around, which implies, just like before, we need to share, but this time we need to share more. So if we teach, take each of those remaining valence electrons, the odd electrons that are unpaired for the oxygen atoms, and move them into position between the two oxygens again, in that instance we're able to now share two pairs of electrons around the shell, which gives us in this instance what we call now a double covalent bond. And looking again at the shared electrons now, with a set of two pairs of shared electrons, that gives each, each of our oxygen atoms a complete octet, and again, more importantly, puts those electrons at the lowest possible potential energy level directly in between the two oxygen nuclei. So for oxygen, we end up forming what we refer to as a double covalent bond. So now that we have modeled the covalent bonding within oxygen, we're going to go ahead and move on and look at one more diatomic molecule here. That is the covalent bonding which occurs within a nitrogen molecule, N2. Looking at nitrogen's position on the periodic table, it has a total of five electrons in its valence shell, and as such we can represent those five valence electrons with yet another Lewis dot structure, showing five electrons around the outside of each of those nitrogen atoms. And just as before, if we bring the two nitrogen atoms close together, we can end up sharing a pair of electrons between those two nitrogens. However, in doing so, it does not complete the octet, as each nitrogen only has at this point six valence electrons. Now just as before, if there are not enough electrons to go around to complete the octets, we're going to end up sharing more electrons. But in order to give each of these nitrogens a grand total of eight electrons in the valence shell, we now need to share not one pair, not two pair, but now three pairs of valence electrons. And in doing so, we put all of those three pairs of electrons at their lowest potential energy positions between the two nitrogen nuclei, completing the octet for each of the nitrogens, and forming now what we refer to as a triple covalent bond. So we've now demonstrated at this point that depending upon the number of electron pairs that need to be shared in order to complete the octet, for these molecules, we can form either single covalent bonds with one shared pair, double covalent bonds with two shared pairs, or triple covalent bonds with three shared pairs of electrons between atoms. Now at this point we're going to go ahead and move on to draw some Lewis dot structures representing the covalent bonding that exists for more complicated molecules. And if you'll have a look at this next slide here, there are some rather complicated rules for how we go about assigning electrons to describe covalent bonding within these molecules. I'd like you to go ahead and please, at this point, pause our recording here and take a moment to please copy down into your notes this slide here, which shows for us the rules for assigning valence electrons to form bonds in covalently bonded molecules. So again, take a moment here and pause and we'll pick up again after you've got that copy down. Alright, ladies and gentlemen, at this point you've copied down our rules for creating Lewis dot structures. We're going to walk through these step by step to talk about the steps you need to take in order to get to a valid structure. Uh, step number one, you need to determine the total number of valence electrons available. In order to find the total number of valence electrons, you need to use your periodic tables, 
and count up the total number of electrons supplied to the molecule by each of the individual component atoms. Now, the thing you have to watch out for in these particular list dot structures are ions. In particular, ions are charged species. And as charged species, we need to adjust the number of electrons available to form our bonds accordingly. In particular, if you have a anion, recall anions are negatively charged, which implies there are more electrons available to the species overall than simply the sum of the valence electrons available from individual neutral atoms. So as such, you need to add a number of electrons equal to the anion's charge to the total available to form the molecule. Or conversely, if you're dealing with a cation, we'll call cations have a positive charge, which implies they have lost some electrons. So to deal with this situation, you need to subtract the number of electrons from the total available, equivalent to the number of electrons lost by the formation of the cation, indicated by the cation's charge. Once you have determined the total number of valence electrons available for the molecule, the next step is to draw the skeletal structure. We are going to start you off here drawing skeletal structures by supplying you with the sequence of atoms in terms of how the bonds form. But later on, we'll ask that you draw your own skeletal structures. And in particular, the number one tendency here is when drawing skeletal structures, we tend to put the less electronegative atom at the center of our structure. Recall this should make sense because atoms at the center of a molecule tend to form multiple bonds, and electronegative elements tend not to have a tendency to share a large number of electrons, they tend to take electrons. So recognizing that the central atom has a tendency to form lots of bonds means it has to share lots of electrons, and therefore putting the less electronegative atom in the center makes logical sense. At this point, we draw the skeletal structure by putting single covalent bonds between each of the atoms in the molecule. And we'll demonstrate that for you by going through our first example here on the next page. So this is an example out of problem set 412. So if you want to go ahead and take out your problem set here, we're going to go ahead and work together problem number 11, which is to demonstrate the covalent bonding that occurs between two atoms of bromine in the diatomic Br2 molecule. Now to start off here, recognize that bromine as a halogen has a total of seven valence electrons. And within the Br2 molecule, there are two bromines, which gives us a total of two times the seven electrons for 14 total electrons available to form bonds in a Br2 molecule. Now that said, with 14 valence electrons, we're going to start by drawing again what we refer to as our skeletal structure. So draw our two bromine atoms, and between the two bromines, we're going to represent a single line representing a single covalent bond that is a shared pair of electrons between the two bromine atoms. Recognizing that we started with a total of 14 electrons in the valence shell, having made that single covalent bond uses up two of the available electrons which we had to distribute. And so, so if we subtract those two valence electrons from the 14 we started with, that means we have a total of 12 electrons remaining in order to complete the octets for our bromine atoms. Now at this point, with 12 electrons remaining, we now need to get a count of how many electrons we still need in order to complete the octets for each of the bromines. Recognizing that the shared pair of electrons in the covalent bond between the bromines represents two electrons, to get from two up to a complete octet, implies each of the bromines still needs six valence electrons in order to complete that octet. And with two bromine atoms, each needing six electrons remaining, we would need a total of 12 electrons to complete the octet for both bromines. If we need 12 electrons and we have 12 remaining, we find ourselves in the happy position where we have exactly what we need. So we can simply go about distributing the lone pairs of electrons to complete the octets for each of the bromines. And in doing so, we have completed our Lewis dot structure, showing a single covalent bond between the two bromines and completed octets for each of the atoms in the molecule.
Now, please note, in this Lewis dot structure, the line represents a shared pair of electrons. And again, with that line as a pair, each of the bromines then has a full octet of eight electrons in the valence shell, with the two electrons in the paired bond at a particularly low potential energy level position. So let's go ahead next and work one more example problem. In this instance, we're going to show the Lewis dot structure for a more complicated species. This is the SO4 2 negative sulfate ion. Following our steps for determining the Lewis structure, number one, we first need to determine the total number of valence electrons available to form bonds between atoms within this species. Looking on your periodic tables, find first sulfur. Sulfur is an oxygen family element, which therefore has a total of six electrons in the valence shell. In addition to the one sulfur, there are also a total of four oxygen atoms. Each oxygen atom, likewise, has a total of six valence electrons available as well, which gives us a total of six times four, or 24 total valence electrons for the oxygen atom. Now, this is the place where most students end up missing this problem right here. The next step is to recognize that as a negatively charged anion, the sulfate ion has more electrons than it would have as neutral independent atoms. So with a minus two charge, we need to first sum up the overall electrons available from sulfur and oxygen, which gives us the total of six from the sulfur plus 24 from the oxygens for 30, and then add to that total a total of two electrons representing the minus two charge on the sulfate ion. This gives us a total of 32 electrons available to distribute when we're forming our species. The next step after having determined the total number of valence electrons available is to draw the skeletal structure for the sulfate ion. And making that sulfate ion, we're going to go ahead and place the sulfur atom at the center of our skeletal structure, recognizing that the central atom is going to be the atom which shares more electrons. Therefore, it would be logical to place the less electronegative sulfur in that central position. Around the outside, we have the four oxygen atoms. And to complete our skeletal structure, we're going to go ahead and place a total of four single covalent bonds to the central sulfur atom. Making those four single covalent bonds uses up a total of eight of our available 32 electrons, leaving with, with a total of 24 electrons remaining to distribute to the rest of our species. At this point, we need to stop and compare the number of valence electrons we still need to complete the octet for each of our atoms in our species with the 24 remaining electrons available that we still have left. And you'll note here that as each oxygen atom with the single covalent bond has currently distributed two electrons, each of the oxygens therefore needs six more electrons to complete the octet. Because we have four oxygen atoms, that's a total of six times four, which gives us 24 electrons necessary to complete our octets. And happily, we find ourselves in the position where the number of electrons remaining is equal to the number of electrons we have available, and we can distribute those electrons as lone pairs to each of the oxygens. Also note, please, that the central sulfur atom already has a complete octet, as it has four single covalent bonds, each of which contain those two valence electrons. All that remains at this point is to show that the species is an ion, and to do that in a Lewis dot structure, we simply need to bracket the entirety of the structure and indicate its minus two charge. Next, we're going to go ahead and take a look at a couple of the exceptions to the Lewis dot structure octet rules. Um, in particular, I would like you to focus here on the very first of the listed exceptions, which is to state that hydrogen exists as a stable species in these compounds with only one covalent bond, that is a set of two valence electrons. This exception should make logical sense because hydrogen itself exists in the first period, and as a first period element, it has a complete shell with only a 1s2 electron configuration. 
because there are no p orbital electrons in the first principal energy level, we do not expect hydrogen to form a complete octet with eight electrons in any of our Lewis dot structures. The remainder of the species on this set of common exceptions to the Lewis dot structure rules. Um, we will come back and revisit these during our next lecture, but if you could please go ahead and take a moment to pause our video here and copy these down into your notes, we'll come back and revisit these again during next class. All right, ladies and gentlemen, at this point we're going to go ahead and do one more example problem. This species HNO3 is nitric acid. And we'll go ahead and start by doing the same things we've done up until this point for drawing Lewis dot structures. We're going to start by determining the number of valence electrons available within our molecule. Hydrogen has a grand total of one electron and therefore one valence electron. Our nitrogen atom in group 5 on the periodic table has a set of five valence electrons. And within the molecule, we have three oxygen atoms, each of which has a total of six valence electrons available to help us complete our octets. Six times three gives us a total of 18. And if we sum up all of those available electrons, that yields a total of 24 electrons total to allow us to form our Lewis dot structure. Once we have determined the number of valence electrons available, our next step in our procedure is to go ahead and draw our skeletal structure. Looking at the species available here, we'll go ahead and put the nitrogen atom at the center as it's less electronegative than the oxygens. And the hydrogen, as it turns out, comes off of one of the oxygens in this particular Lewis dot structure. Going ahead next, we'll go ahead and make single bonds between each of the species present in the molecule making four single covalent bonds, uses up a total of eight valence electrons. Subtracting those from the 24 we began with leaves us with a total of 16 that still remain to allow us to fill our octets. At this point, we're going to go ahead and make a comparison between how many electrons we still have available versus how many we need in order to complete our octets. We'll go ahead and have a look at the oxygen on the left. With a single bonded pair, it needs a total of six to complete its octet, as does the oxygen on the right. The nitrogen with three single covalent bonds has six electrons currently distributed, which means it only needs two more to complete the octet. And the upper oxygen with two bonds needs a total of four more to complete the octet. Hydrogen, in this case, does not need any additional electrons, as it is full in its shell with only a set of two electrons as it exists in the first energy level. Adding all of these electrons up that we still need gives us 6 plus 2 is 8, plus 6 is 14, plus another 4 is 18. So we have 16 electrons available, but we need 18, which implies at this point that there's not enough to go around. And just like a kindergartner, if there's not enough to go around, the kindergartner has to learn how to share. So at this point, we need to go ahead and share another pair of electrons in forming a double covalent bond. We'll go ahead and put that double covalent bond between the nitrogen and the oxygen. And we can go ahead next to recount and see how many electrons we still need after having formed that double covalent bond. Recognizing that forming that bond, we used up an additional two electrons. That means that 14 remain still to be distributed. And now recounting the oxygen on the left-hand side with now two bonded pairs, only needs four to complete its octet. Nitrogen in the center has four bonds around it, each containing two electrons, which means we've got a complete octet there already. And the oxygen on the right-hand side still needs six remaining to complete its octet. And the oxygen up top still needs four. And the hydrogen remains, again, complete with only the two electrons in its valence shell. So at this point, we now have a total of 14 electrons, which we have, and happily, we find ourselves with 14 electrons that we need, which means we can go ahead and finish up our Lewis dot structure by simply distributing the remaining lone pairs of electrons to our atoms to fill the octet rule for all of the species present.
And that gives us now a stable Lewis dot diagram for the species HNO3 nitric acid. At this point, if you could please take out for me problem set 412. The only thing that remains in this lecture is to have a look at the problems within 412. And please copy down onto your homework set here the skeletal structures which are up here on the board. Again, please go ahead and pause the video as appropriate so you can get all these skeletal structures copied down. And these will assist you in terms of determining the structure of the molecules as you go forth to do your homework assignment coming up next. So again, please pause the video as appropriate and copy down all the remaining skeletal structures onto your problem set 412.